You're listening to the Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Enjoy. Joining us this hour is a renowned equine lover, Linda Kohanov, advocate and beneficiary of a lifetime of relation with horses. Her book, The Power of the Herd, A Non-Predatory Approach to Social Intelligence, Leadership, and Innovation, is a New World Library 2013 release. And as you'll hear from Linda, her organization, Epona Quest, follows an ancient code of ethics where humans Horses and other animals are supported in co-creating a new way of being, one that emphasizes authenticity, collaboration, and healthy experimentation. The emphasis, she points out, is on learning how to thrive rather than simply survive, expanding both human and animal consciousness and potential, finding in the horse culture a bold style of leadership and community making. Linda shows that we and horses have a lot to learn from each other and with each other. And while horse culture may have been changed with the advent of the car, horse wisdom and beauty has not been lost in the world. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zoe. It's great to be here. And to get your name right, it's Kohanov, right? Yes, that's it. All right, I want to be sure. So your book is really um, uh, a a full life's work, I'd say. It's not just (laughs) something you sit down and breeze through. It's really a text of everything you've learned and teach. Tell our audience a little bit about how you got involved with horses personally, and then we'll look at some of the elements of the book. Well, I was actually a music critic and um, in the media. I was on radio, and um, I was getting quite frustrated with the human race on a daily basis, and I decided to get a horse and ride out into the desert to get away from frustrations on a regular basis and renew myself. But what I found was that the horses would actually mirror the emotional state that I was in, and they would also show me immediately when I was becoming better adjusted and more centered. And I thought, wow, somebody should bottle this and and give it to other people because this is an amazing um, experience I'm having out here. (laughs) Hello to the canines as well. Yes, I have a few dogs. (laughs) We do as well. And, and, you know, it's funny. They join me in the studio. I'm hoping they can't hear this. They'll start barking, which they don't normally do. So when you discovered this, you then changed your life quite radically. Yes, well, um, it actually took place over a number of years. Um, It took me about 10 years to really understand what I was learning from the horses and be able to put it into words. And so my first book, The Dow of Equus, came out in around 2001. And what happened was, you know, I thought it was a kind of a radical book, and it actually was at that time, to talk about what humans could learn from horses rather than what we have to teach them. And at the same time, the book struck a chord with a lot of kindred spirits from around the world who then came out and and wanted to study with me. Mm -hmm. So then I had to learn to teach these skills to humans in an effective way. And so I've spent the last 12 years learning to do that better and better each year, I think. And and the book does such a beautiful job for those that perhaps won't be able to join you or won't have an opportunity to study in a workshop or, or just because of wherever they are at this time in their life. They can read The Power of the Herd and really learn the 12-point methods that you share. But you, you show in the beginning of the book, it was very interesting, that there were some great world leaders like Winston Churchill. Um, you pointed out some others, uh, Buddha, that they were all, I think the other was... Um, um, who else was there? Anyway, George you, Washington. That's, that's right, George one. Washington, exactly. Yeah. And that horse, their their nonverbal communication and their style of leadership also involved the fact, you point out, that they were also on horses. Yes, well, um, I began to, once I understood how horses were making me more aware of nonverbal communication and very subtle power plays that go on in relationships with all beings that are social, Um, which is something we have in common with horses, I could also see that there were great rider leaders throughout history that were doing things that were unique. Um, And I could tell that what was going on was that they were influenced severely by horse behavior in the most positive way possible. And, you know, really only about 10% of human communication is verbal. Some of it, a little more of it has to do with vocal tone, but... Most of our communication between each other is nonverbal. 
And yet we become increasingly addicted to words to the point where a lot of times we don't even talk on the phone anymore, so we've left vocal tone out of the equation. But when you look at leadership presence and the ability to influence others toward admirable goals, what you find is that that is mostly a nonverbal phenomenon. People talk about charisma or that extra something that somebody has. And as it turns out, you can exercise that through working with horses because they're exercising that other 90 percent. And, and you also, I, I mean, there's so many things in the book and there's no way we can get to them all. It's an enormous task to um, really study this book and, and digest the whole thing. But I did my best. And I liked that you talked about both Buddha, Jesus and Lao Tzu as an example of this kind of horse leadership, which is non-predatory. And that doesn't mean that it's not assertive, but it doesn't have to be aggressive. Exactly. Yeah, when I looked at, um, I was looking at the topic of power for this latest book, and I realized that, you know, religion wields a lot of power in this world. And I was looking at that topic because also a lot of visionary leaders are essentially religious leaders, too, throughout history. And um, I noticed that there were three major religious figures that had a very significant non-predatory style of leadership that they were literally trying to bring into the world, and then religions were created up around them. And I think that they did have some access, definitely, to some deep spiritual truths and that were trying to be brought through into the world. But their way of being in the world and their way of interacting with others is very much about non-predatory forms of power and social interaction, and that would be Lao Tzu in China and the Buddha, and also Jesus was really quite an amazing figure if you look at him from that point of view. And and so then turning this back to the horse culture, share with us some of the, the broader perspectives you've gained about, I mean, people often think, and, and it's sort of a misinterpretation, we've talked about this on the show in general, about animals and packs that are family and community with memory and tradition, and that they're just not things to be dominated and exploited, as we see certainly in most of modern animal husbandry. So, so the horse, as you point out, has a whole way of sharing and creating community. Yes, they're they're very interesting animals because you know a lot of a lot of the animals that we've domesticated are predator predators or at the very least omnivores. You know, dogs, cats, dolphins, birds. They're all um, you know have some predatory elements, and the horse is one of the few animals that we're close to that is an herbivore and has a completely different way of being in the world as a result. And yet horses are not rabbits. They're not quivering, gutless victims. They're actually non-predatory power animals, and they will support each other and protect each other. And they'll actually, in nature, perform altruistic acts to protect vulnerable herd members from wolves and lions. And wolves and lions don't actually attack adult horses, especially in groups, if they're at all smart. They don't actually, they're usually not very successful, and so the smart ones don't even try that. And so there's this tremendous ability to be inspired to step up and be powerful in the world, but not with the mentality of a lone wolf or, you know, the mama grizzly idea that we hear thrown about sometimes, but in terms of an animal that is social and considers the individual and group needs of the herd simultaneously and also has the ability to be out in nature, to move with the seasons, the changing resources. They're actually nomadic animals, and so they actually keep their herds together, but they're not territorial. And so it gives this whole other way of looking at the world and seeing how we can be effective and powerful in the world without the idea of, always basing our understanding of this on the idea of lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. It's, uh, you know, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it's so interesting because you talk about the nomadic cultures that were nomads using horses. Of course, some nomadic cultures aren't necessarily horse-centered. They might be camel-centered. However, you, you talked about the Mongolian nomad and some of the African tribes, and you show us that from their experience in herding and being nomads, they really represent what human empathy best looks like. Yeah, they're, it was really fascinating to go back and study these pastoral cultures that move with the animals. And what you see is 
they don't confine and use the animals in the same way that we do in modern times where we see them as purely meat producers or milk producers. Um, in those cultures, in order to have these animals move with you across vast open expanses without fences, they actually have to engage in a, a form of interspecies socialization where the herd and the tribe come together and influence each other and mutually nourish each other. And so you begin to see this way in which these tribes were influenced by this large herbivore behavior for the better, and they have a very sophisticated understanding of leadership and group cohesion as they move across these vast open spaces. And one of the things that was, is most startling to most people that I encounter is that in herds of large herbivores, the dominant animal and the leader animal are often two different animals. And so you begin to see that dominance and leadership can be useful in certain situations, but they are not always the same thing, and they do not always need to be merged. When you look at your own approach and you look at what value has come from the nomadic culture, what it makes me think of is is modern people's experience with dogs in trying to have this kind of community. It's so interesting, the sort of the whole trans-species communication and trans-species psychology that is really, I guess, on, on the... Um, the forefront of everybody who cares about sentient consciousness. When you, when you take this out to the world, how do people respond to this notion that, you know, there's this thing that the horses can teach us and it's not about our dominating them or telling them what to do? Well, we do at times have to tell them what to do, and um, but there's a way in which we can trade leadership roles according to situations. So I, sometimes I call this consensual leadership or situational leadership, where we can learn how to let the talents of others come forward as mm -hmm. appropriate, rather than always have one person being seen as the hierarchical king or CEO in charge, that, that from horses we really learn how to exchange leadership roles. Some people have for years seen horses as having um, these dominant hierarchies, but that was influenced a lot by their own human mentality being influenced by this always looking for a dominance hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The way but the scientists observe it. When you really look at herds it. of adult horses, they're often exchanging leadership roles according to who's calmest, clearest, most experienced, or most invested in the outcome. And so we can learn a lot from that. Well, and you pointed out that the female in the herd will do that for the whole community the same way women in society do that. I'm, and my husband interviewed somebody when we talked about the oxytocin principle, that there's a hormonal reality to what women and the female in the herd offers. Yes, and the oxytocin hormone is um, one that buffers the flight or fight response in favor of a calm and connect response. And it actually is a hormone that shows that nature wants us to overcome our flight or fight responses to reach out to others, and to actually create these larger social networks of mutual aid. And um, the interesting thing about these herding cultures, these pastoral cultures, is that men actually have a large boost of oxytocin that they've shown by spending a large amount of time interacting with, grooming, and petting, and taking care of the animals. So men can actually have oxytocin boosted as well through daily interactions, close interactions with animals. So instead of a gym in the CEO's repertoire, we should have a petting animal room, you know? right? <laughs> a visit from the local animals. Well, when you you point out so many fascinating things in terms of what you've learned through your relationship with equines, but you show that one of the things we tend to do as humans is we tend to objectify things, meaning we impact our ability to relate to others, you point out, because when we do this with animals, we do it with everything. We treat people and, and situations like utilities rather than having value unto themselves. Yeah, we've objectified. I mean, it's still perfectly legal and accepted to objectify animals, although we're starting to move out of objectifying women or African-Americans or other cultures. We're starting to move out of that, and the next big leap of faith for all of us is to learn to see animals as individuals with their own unique needs and talents and challenges that they have to work through. 
When you look at examples of how many people, I mean, you've encountered thousands and thousands of people, and they're changed by this process that you help them. And we'll we'll go through some of the twelve parts of it. But you you generally help people overcome fear, and and weaknesses that hamper our lives. Share with us a little bit about that journey for a person. Well, one of the things that you learn from when you work with horses is that you have to work with fear in a different way because, first of all, your body will will show a certain amount of fear in the presence of a horse whether your mind thinks they're cute and cuddly or not because they're just so massive and impressive and there's something in your body that knows you need to be aware around them. And um, what I find, too, is that a lot of times women are really feel pretty comfortable around horses pretty quickly unless they've had a bad experience. But a lot of men feel really intimidated around horses because they know that they, they're they not the strongest one in the room at that point or in the corral at that point, and that's kind of intimidating. Whereas women grow up being not the strongest one in the room if you're hanging around most men. So it's a really interesting thing for men to have to confront that and see how they react to it. Some of them get very controlling and dominant and aggressive as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they learn how to feel fear and use it in a different way to keep themselves safe and aware without lashing out and trying to control others. Um, One thing that women often have to learn is that kindness and sympathy and understanding are often not enough to gain the respect of a horse. And so they'll often go to a nurturing place and try to align with the horse and almost seduce the horse at times. And the horse really demands that you stand in your own power and, and that you actually stand up for yourself. So horses kind of help men balance and help women balance in the ways that they need to. And horses use fear as, a, as an alarm system, as nature's alarm system. And so they teach you how to use that, and then they teach you how to let it go immediately and then go back to grazing, go back to enjoying life. Well, and as you pointed out, you know, sometimes our adrenal glands are so overstimulated by the news and movies and conversation and all the things that people can be told to be afraid of, even if it's not an obvious threat in their life in any way, but the immediacy of the image uh, kicks that, again, that, that fight or flight syndrome. And, and you point out that overcoming this, and I have other guests who have said the same thing, that that's really a large um, part of what we need to accomplish is, is to reserve our energy for what's really an emergency. Yeah, and I think that um, one of the things that's so exciting is When you have a person go in with a horse and you teach them how to set effective, assertive, yet non-abusive boundaries with a horse, and, you know, you you actually have to have real power. It can't be just imagined power in your head. It has to be power enacted in the moment that's not abusive that knows how to set a boundary and maintain safety, but then immediately go to a place of relaxation and connection with the horse. When you have that combination, what you find is that when you go back to work and you're 200-pound boss or colleague comes over and tries to intimidate you, it's almost laughable because you've just stood up to someone who weighs a 1,000 pounds and succeeded in connecting with them. And so over the years, what I've done is teach people how to transfer this experience of setting boundaries with a horse and motivating a horse through then using the same principle with aggressive people in their lives, um, whether it's your boss or your husband or 10-year-old son or, you know, somebody, somebody else um, in a political or social sphere, when you learn the same techniques, and some of it's nonverbal, you find that people immediately respect you, and a lot of your relationships change almost overnight. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, you know, and you point out that you combine that with one of your points in terms of the guiding principles um, is to develop a high tolerance for vulnerability. So it's not just that you're standing there boldly being brash. It's that there's really a, an undercurrent of, of, of true humility and being open to what might come. Yeah. And I mean, that's another thing that, um, that really makes a difference um, is understanding when you're working with horses is what is legitimate fear for physical safety, which which I call fear. And then I use the term vulnerability to talk about those things that really aren't physical danger type fears. They're more like the fear of doing something new and looking foolish or stepping into the unknown and trying something new and experimenting. 
And so horses are actually really good at supporting people when they feel vulnerable because they're stepping into doing something new and experimenting. A horse is actually attracted to a person who is vulnerable because in nature um, horses will protect vulnerable herd members. And so you actually get rewarded when you're around horses for saying, I don't know what I'm doing next. I'm a little nervous about experimenting. Um, and yet... I'm I'm not feeling unsafe around this horse. Mm-hmm. And well, so really telling the difference between when you're feeling vulnerable, which means you're physically safe, but you're trying something new, or you one of your favorite coping strategies isn't working, or one of your comfortable habits isn't working, that you realize, oh, I'm not in danger here. Now I just need support to move forward and experiment and learn something new. And a lot of people get really nasty and very defensive when they're feeling vulnerable, acting like they're in physical danger, when in fact it's a different, it's a different kind of fear. Well, we see that in politics all the time. There's such a fear of loss of control of what's already known, whether it works or doesn't work, that there's this ongoing habitual pattern that has proven itself to be, you know, very destructive. And it doesn't matter which party, but it's exactly that problem of of holding on to some sort of dominating, um, I guess, perspective and not being vulnerable enough to hear the other side. Exactly. I mean, what what was so interesting to me was to realize that everybody would benefit from a kind of emotional strength training where, as I recommend in Guiding Principle 5, that you develop a high tolerance for feeling vulnerable so that you can be in a place where you don't know what's next or you can see that the rules and the, the old rules and the old ways of doing things aren't really working anymore and everybody has to try something new. Um, if you have a high tolerance for feeling vulnerable, then you can think, think straight in those situations and negotiate properly, whereas the people who have a low tolerance for feeling vulnerable often get very dominant and nasty and undermining or outright aggressive. And like you say, that's what we're seeing in politics all the time, and that's why we never get anywhere. Well, exactly, and we have to take a little break, but when we come back, we can talk about, you know, the news is a good example, or going to a public event or being in a group conversation where there is really contagious emotions. And oftentimes we get led into feeling and doing things that aren't naturally our own. Hi, this is Marta Williams, author of My Animal, Myself. You can come visit me at my website, martawilliams.com. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Sahara Hieronymus. Anyway, your book is beautiful, The Power of the Herd, A Non-Predatory Approach to Social Intelligence, Leadership, and Innovation. It's a New World Library 2013 release. And we haven't gotten yet to your organization, but let me give you out your website, www.eponaquest, E-P-O-N-A, quest.com. But before we do, I wanted to just have you talk very briefly about the reality of contagious emotions, because sometimes we're at work or in a group situation or family dynamic, and somebody will do something that's really rude or just just inappropriate, and it upsets the entire community. How do we learn from horses, as you show, to, you know, work with even what's happening unconsciously. Well, when I first started working with horses, I I began to see that whatever mood I was in, they would be sort of catching and mirroring. And I could also tell what mood other people were in at the barn by how their horse was acting, no matter what kind of mask of well-being or control they were wearing. And that was in the 1990s, before we had any real research to show that emotions are, in fact, contagious. And so there is research to show that that is happening. Um, Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book Social Intelligence, absolutely confirms that emotions are in, in contagious in a group. And so what you do when you're around horses is you learn to do something really advanced with that, because they're so big and they're, they can be so dangerous if they're panicking or becoming aggressive is that you begin to use your own body to feel the emotional tone of something that's happening in the group shift. But then you learn how to engage a different emotion and project an an additional feeling of peace and well-being um, backed by a sense of power and setting boundaries. It causes the horses around you to calm down and get focused. And that's something that I began to see that great leaders such as George Washington, who was considered the best horse trainer in the colonies. Most people don't know that. 
is that he was used to calming and focusing horses to go into war, which is something completely against every hardwired impulse the horse has. I mean, the horse is a prey animal. They, they, they're supposed to run away from the smell of blood. And yet he could actually calm and focus and train horses to go into that situation. And there's a, an amazing story that's told about him where a bunch of people were panicking during the Revolutionary War, and he actually got this horse that he rode to walk up onto the center of a bridge that everybody was freaking out and running across. And soldiers reported seeing not just the general, but the horse being so calm and peaceful that they even, some of them even leaned up against the horse and caught that sense of contagious power and, and poise in the midst of chaos, and it completely turned the battle around and they ended up winning it. And it was partly due to the feeling of what that horse was capable of doing. And so you begin to see this huge, amazing ability of someone like Washington to calm and focus a horse and then almost send this gigantic um, charge of peace and focus and poise out to others that they also caught contagiously, and it turned their fear and panic around. Well, and as you make so clear, it's, it's on one level we can think of this as that our body is the horse, that our mind rides. So what we're learning from horses is really something we need to learn about ourselves. And you talk about that, sort of having a scan of yourself, because sometimes you can have more than one emotion simultaneously and being able to separate, as you point out, fear from um, maybe just uncertainty or too much going on simultaneously around you in a conference room or in a family situation and isolating what's the most important. Share with us a little bit about how you teach people who come to do this scan so they can really understand what their body, their horse, is telling them. Yes. I mean, that's one thing that I do say is your body is the horse your mind rides around on. It's a sentient being, not a machine. And it picks up the emotions of others and responds to the environment um, based on contagious emotions and other information it's picking up that your thinking brain will often ignore because it's paying attention to something else. And so if you can get your thinking brain to not just pay attention to what its agenda is, but also scan the body constantly and notice changes in the body, um, and I actually talk about this rather extensively in the book about how to do this before you go into a business meeting or a family gathering, that you scan your own body first and you notice what sensations you're feeling without trying to change them. Because if you have a nervous stomach and your shoulders are tense, but your spine feels aligned and you feel grounded, that's kind of what you're walking into the room with. And if you walk into the room and you notice that your shoulders relax and the nervousness in your belly goes away, then you pretty much know your body's reading the room and saying, I feel really good in here. But if you you know, sort of get this baseline reading um, that your shoulders are tense and your gut is um, clenched. And then you walk into the room and you feel sick to your stomach when you look at somebody or maybe even kicked in the belly or the hair rises up on the back of your neck. You, your body is reading the room for you, letting you know that um, something in here needs to be paid attention to. But you also learn to be poised and thoughtful in the midst of that rather than it just overwhelm you unconsciously. And that's the difference. Well, and and the subtleties are so important because all of us have experienced being someplace, whether it's a store or a mall or a public event, and making eye contact with somebody that just doesn't make you feel right. Whatever it is, it's vibrational. And, And understanding that, I mean, that's the beauty of of animals in general, the sentient community that's not human doesn't disavow what they feel. And we tend to pretend that what we feel doesn't mean anything. They're just quote unquote feelings rather than understanding that it's really part of our sensing apparatus that if we can improve it, it it's really what intuition um, gets sort of born from the more you practice it. Absolutely. And that's That's one of the things that I learned early on from the horses is that they use feeling and and emotion as information. And it took me a few years, but I finally narrowed it down to a four-point method that horses use in dealing with emotion. They they feel the emotion in its purest form, and then they get the message behind the emotion. They change something in response to that information, and then they let it go and go back to grazing. So horses spend a lot more time in a state of deep peace and connection 
with each other and the environment than humans do um, because they're not stuffing emotions down that they're not paying attention to. They're getting the message. They're responding to it, making some change, and then they let it go and they just get back to enjoying life. And when you travel around the world with EponaQuest and teaching these workshops, sometimes in corporations, sometimes, you know, out with horses, are there cultures that seem to respond or have maintained this kind of innocent alliance that we don't necessarily see? Though, of course, there's a horse culture that's a very hybrid culture and there's horse racing, but I've always thought of that as questionably exploitive, but I've been told by those who own horses that race, oh, no, the horses love it, and they're taken care of, and they have long lives, and this and that, but I've never quite, when I when you saw it with natives racing, it was just sport for fun, for community adherence, you know, to bring the tribe together, and now it's a competition, and I've always sort of felt like it's not a lot of dif- different than a lot of other sporting competitions. Well, the interesting thing is that we have to stop objectifying horses on either side of that question because, as it turns out, there are some horses that love to compete, like there are Mm -hmm. some humans that love to compete. And so competition is only abusive when you have a horse that doesn't really like to compete and has an owner that's making them do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I I have encountered, um, you know, in Kentucky, people have brought me in to look at race horses who are, like, really talented and have great bloodlines. Um, but they, they won't run. And I'm like, well, they want to do something else, you know. And then when they find the something else the horse likes, the horse excels and is happy. So, so horses are individuals, too, and some of them love to compete, and some of them find it, it would be like, you know, somebody putting, you know, their son, making their son play soccer when he wants to play music, you know. It's the same kind of thing. And also, as you point out, and we've only talked a little bit about some of these 12 different qualities that we can practice, but as you, you, you talk about, there's something like a dark horse. I mean, I love that from George Harrison, but <laughs> you had a horse named Merlin, and I think it's sort of the epitome of that story. And all of us can encounter this in our life in, in a personage or an event or a task. Yeah, Merlin was a stallion, Midnight Merlin, an Arabian stallion, a black Arabian stallion, who had been abused um, by, you know, he he was really vivacious and highly sensitive and very intelligent and very powerful. And, you know, a lot of people don't know how to deal with a horse like that. Even some very experienced trainers will become overly reactive and abusive and punish a horse for just kind of expressing himself. And so he had a trainer that um, basically took every... Thing the horse was doing personally and punished him and over and over and over again to the point where they tied this horse's head between his legs in a darkened stall to make him bow down in shame and pain for days. Mm. And it short-circuited his nervous system, and he was insane. And um, I took this horse on thinking that, you know, I had a lot of great, you know, experience with, with horses, and, and I knew a lot of very enlightened training techniques and body work and all that, and I thought, oh, I'm going to cure this horse with kindness and sympathy and understanding. And it absolutely was not working. And Merlin was the one who showed me that I actually needed to be powerful, that it had to be a different form of power than the kind that was power over abusive. I had to stand up for myself, and I actually had to take almost the brunt of all the abuse he had received without taking it personally, hold boundaries with him. And then the split second he backed off, I had to, to literally with my entire body breathe and sigh and connect, even if it was just for two seconds, to show him that if he gave me space, he would get this beautiful, calm, connected feeling rather than this punishment and abuse. And that was the turning point. And um, so I learned how to use power in this whole new way. And then I learned that, you know, we all need power. But a lot of the conflicts that I see out there now, I see happen because people don't know how to use power effectively without hurting others. Mm -hmm. And um, so you see a lot of unconscious power plays among women, for instance. They'll engage in passive-aggressive power plays and hurt each other and gossip and and demean each other behind the scenes and create toxic environments at work and at home because they don't know how to use power. And yet once a person really knows how to use power, they can actually be in the presence of extremely chaotic situations, and they can peacefully 
yet powerfully turn those situations around. Well, and I think and, probably as you found, I, uh, our dear friend, the late Ingo Swan, wrote a whole book on power and just discovered there's no schools to teach about power. There are no books on human powers. And I'm talking about non-local consciousness and some of the things you're describing, which are really inner powers that we cultivate from within. They're not given to us from without. And most of the power that most of us grow up with is hierarchical, and it descends upon you through some system of relationship rather than it's something cultivated within. So I'm just so glad to see what you do. And as you travel the world, we have to take our last break of the evening. I want to encourage my audience to buy your book, The Power of the Herd, a non-predatory approach to social intelligence, leadership, and innovation. It's a New World Library 2013 release. Hi, this is Jim Mosma. I'm the center director of Second Chance Wildlife Center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And if you'd like to learn more on how you can help wildlife, particularly those who are orphaned, sick, or injured, log on to our website at www.scwc, that stands for Second Chance Wildlife Center, .org. And meanwhile, you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Author Linda Kohanov is our guest. Her book, The Power of the Herd, a non-predatory approach to social intelligence, leadership, and innovation, a New World Library 2013 release, and it's over 430-some pages. You will really appreciate it. And, Linda, I want to be sure to give you a chance to talk to us a little bit about Eponiquest Worldwide, which is your organization. Yes. Um, it's named after Epona, which is the Celtic goddess of horses and, and transformation and healing. And that's kind of the three elements we're combining here. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've trained over 200 instructors in this work worldwide. And so there's actually some instructors in the Baltimore area who teach this work. So you can go out and, um, well, you can actually go onto my website, oponaquest.com, and then look up for the instructors in your region. And any instructor with the designation POH, or Power of the Herd, next to their name, also can do some additional work with you to use this book as a textbook. They can coach you, they can coach you in person or even over the phone about how to take this horse wisdom back into the human world. So um, I'm really excited about that, and it's nice to be able to, to spread this wisdom all across, well, now on five continents. Oh, that's wonderful. No, and, and when you look at the programs, I mean, there's short ones, there's longer ones, there's intensive ones someplace in the outback, and there are others where you don't necessarily encounter a horse. And for those who have never had an experience with a horse, how, how is this for that kind of journey? -er? Well, we actually work with horses that are really good with humans. So we're not going to throw you in with a horse like the stallion I worked with, Merlin, who taught me a lot, but... Um, we work with horses that <clears throat> are really good teachers and are really good at taking care of humans to start off with. And then over time, as you get more accomplished, we can actually raise the difficulty level with younger horses or, or horses that you have to set stronger boundaries with. So, and, and what's your experience, knowing you have dogs and other animals and horses, how would you describe the telepathic communication between humans and horses? Well, I've been completely convinced that there is such a thing through numerous experiences that shocked me. <laughs> like what? Give us an example. Well, um, here's a funny example. It'll take me about two minutes to tell, but um, we, have a, we had a group of horses. Well, we do have a group of these three amazing mares at our place, and um, we had these feeders that would control how quickly they could eat their hay through this grate that they had to pull the hay through. And one of the horses was getting really frustrated and was knocking the box around. And so then we, I started telling my staff, well, you know, we were going to have to loosen the hay up for those horses or they're going to destroy the boxes. You're going to have to fluff up the hay every day. You need to go in and fluff the hay. And I would just say this every single day. Go in, pull the grate off, fluff up the hay, and then, you know, for these mares. And I had a young woman come, or well, actually she's one of my instructors, um, she came and was connecting with the horses through this process where you begin to use your body as a sensing device and, and begin to get messages from your body as well as the horse. And she said, well, I keep getting this weird phrase. And I said, what is it? And she said, I keep getting the phrase, make it fluffy or fluff it up. Or... <laughs> <laughs> and she had no idea that, you know, and we, we had no idea that a horse would pick up on that. So when she was interacting with the one mare that was most concerned about that, the, 
horse was literally sending her the words that we use to make that hay more palatable for her. Mm-hmm. Well, so yeah. that's a great example. Yes, and and when other people, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you do because you're encouraging so many people to make a difference in the world with a respectful and reverent relationship with a very large part of our animal kingdom. And when we think about the time period on this planet when horse culture was all culture. Yeah, it's it's just so amazing. I mean, toward the end of the book, I make a very strong case based on some current research that horses and humans co-evolved, that we actually helped each other evolve to the level that we're at. It's a very interesting new um, form of research that's going on, and I, for one, believe it, and I believe it's still going on, that horses are helping us evolve to a whole new level. Um, If we would only stop and maybe get off our high horse out of the (laughs) saddle and stand next to them and listen to them and work with them, as teachers and not just always as students or children. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I've interviewed so many different sanctuary caregivers and telepaths, whether it's with dolphins or dogs or elephants. And there seems to be a consensus among the groups that I've interviewed over the last decade that there's a sense of kind of an urgency of this relationship and of this listening and of this honoring. How do you look at it? Well, I've had some very interesting experiences where that that, that was definitely coming forth. It, it was It's almost as if the animals see how out of balance we are, and certain members of the species are, are stepping forward and saying, um, or certain members of each species are stepping forward and saying, okay, we're willing to go into this situation and, and, and help these people out here. And um, I see it happen, happening over and over again that horses are acting much wiser and more, um, they, they're, they're protecting people, they're healing people far beyond what you would say would be their training or even their years of experience. And um, something's going on, something very exciting. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad that we live in, in the 21st century and that we're not burned at the stake for considering this possibility. Yeah, it's, it's a really, it, I agree with you and, and for myself and I think all people who have a reverence and a and a love of the holiness in all life understand that consciousness is the field in which everything that exists exists in and it's a question of being able to get quiet enough to sort of ride in on the beam of each sentient creature's consciousness because that's what telepathy is i mean i'm i'm a telepath not all the time and it's much harder with my own animals than somebody else's even a thousand miles away which is always an interesting thing it's like the doctor <laughs> who can't take care of their own children for you know because when you have an emotional attachment in history it kind of clouds the screen or the ears and for and for yourself absolutely i mean no doctor would operate on his own children unless mm-hmm. it was an emergency that's mm-hmm. we're all too close to those situations mm-hmm. and and with the remaining minutes and a half or so. What are some of the hopes you have for the work you're doing and any questions you still have left? Well, I'm just, I'm just really excited to, to see the work proliferate and the, the wisdom that horses have to offer, getting further and further into the human world to the point where I'm actually doing my first two-day workshop in the heart of New York City in October. And um, that will be an indoor workshop where I'm teaching people how to take the wisdom of the horse right back into the human world immediately. Mm -hmm. And to think that we've reached the point where we can translate horse wisdom into contexts where people may still be not ready to go out to the barn, but they can learn some things that they can immediately use to transform their lives. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it's so interesting. When I got your book, I've been fantasizing of of having a horse. I used to ride when I was younger, and I recently, we have dogs, and we used to have hens in a garden, and and I said, yeah, I think I just need a horse. (laughs) I reminded myself of the kind of care it takes, um, but but I really respect and appreciate what you're doing, Linda, and the fact that you've, and this book is beautiful. I don't feel I can do justice to all of it, because you've drawn from so many traditions and your own personal experience. And um, is there anything you'd like to say to the horses that are listening? <laughs> well, you know, stand in your power and step up and keep working on those humans. They need it. <laughs> well, they are listening. You have one. There's one outside your barn, a female, a brownish color one, and she's listening. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know her name, but I'll say hello. Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> 
ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful book. And really, if you've never had a horse or never ridden, it doesn't matter. What you can learn is what Linda has learned from the horses herself. The Power of the Herd, a non-predatory approach to social intelligence. Go to www.uponaquest.com. That's the end of the hour. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, and remember, we do need more love in the world.